This message entitled, Once Again We Are Here, was delivered to Christ Our Rock Bible Church on December 24th, 2018 by the Rev. Roy D. Warren Jr. The scripture reference is Luke 2, 1-20. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should, should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. I'm there. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe laying in the manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concentrating this concerning this child and all they and all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds but mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart and the shepherds returned glorifying and praising god for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them Once again, we are here. And everybody knows this is Christmas Eve, meaning it's the day before Christmas Day. Once again, and every year we have a gathering like this and we lift up the name of Jesus, amen? Once again, we are here. I see we've had another little bit of artwork added to the sign. (laughs) But uh, that's the way it is. Amen? (laughs) All right. Praise the Lord. Once again, we are here. And that's what I want to speak about here tonight. Would you join me in prayer, please? Dear God, it's your mercy and grace that draws us to this place, brings us to this time. You didn't leave it to chance, really, for any of us. You made it clear to us this is where you wanted us. And I want to thank you for that, dear God, because, Lord, it's the best choice. There are lots of other things we could be doing, lots of other things. Lord, I remember when I was a kid, we had a family gathering at my grandmother's house on Christmas Eve. But when it came time for church, our family left and went to the church. We were there for the service, and then we came back to my grandmother's. It's the most important part of Christmas. And so I want to thank you, dear God, that you have made that, I think, abundantly clear through the call upon our hearts and lives to take that seriously tonight. Help us, dear God, to remember that and to know that in years to come. So we thank you and we praise you, Lord. Once again, Lord, we are here and we are here for a purpose. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Amen. 
story is told of a little girl who is seated with her parents in a restaurant. The waitress takes their order. The mother orders what she wants. The father orders what he wants. And then he orders for his little daughter. And he says to the waitress, she'll have a hamburger and french fries. But the waitress, evidently not worthy, worrying too much about the tip, ignores the father's order for his daughter, and instead she turns to the little bright-faced uh, girl and asks, is that what you wanted? The hamburger and the fries. Is that what you wanted? Well, began the little girl, I was kind of hoping for a hot dog this time and a milkshake, a chocolate one. When the waitress returned with the food, she placed before the little girl a hot dog and a big chocolate milkshake. After all the food was distributed and the waitress had turned to leave, the little girl looked in awe at what was before her and finally said, golly, she thinks I'm real. I think you know what she's talking about. I have a feeling probably a lot of times little children feel like second class citizens, you know, where everybody says, okay, this is it, this is it, this is it, and maybe don't even ask them what they want. For example, in a restaurant like that. She wanted a hot dog and she wanted a milkshake and now she feels real. I think a lot of times probably little children could easily start to feel perhaps even less than human because they're, well, what they, what they want for supper in a restaurant or a lot of other situations in life are oftentimes ignored just because they are short. Uh, listen, compared to God, we're all short. Amen? And yet he still cares about what we think we want, what we think we need, and he's willing to deal with it in one way or another. We've got to recognize that some people, I've heard people say this, so I know it's true in some people's minds, that Christmas is for kids. <clears throat> Literally. You know, it's all about the kids. I mean, everything. Everything about Christmas is for the kids. It has nothing to do with the adults. Uh, people, that's a cop-out. That's a cop-out. That lets the adults start to think that they don't have to think about anything that has to do with Christmas or who Jesus is or any of that and what he expects out of, out of our lives and so forth. If we just say, it's all for the kids. No, I think we're all in this thing together. I think we, are, we have to be on a level playing field, so to speak, both children and adults. Some may be shorter than others. Some may be taller than others. It doesn't matter. We're all in this thing together. His being Lord at his birth is for all of us, not just for children and not just for adults either. Amen? Amen. The fact is, we all have to be real. There's got to be a reality in who we are and what we believe and, and what we're thinking and what direction we travel and all of it. There's a story told, and by the way, this is a true story. It comes from uh, Robert Morgan, who wrote the book uh, On This Day. And um, it's a true story. It's, it really did happen a long, long time ago, back in 496 AD. It happened a long time ago. He starts out by saying, not all who sing Christmas carols are Christians. Superficial sentiment is sometimes substituted for genuine faith. Take Clovis, for example. Yeah, that was the guy's name. 
Some of you might think, you know, I wish I had a different name. Well, you had the name Clovis, you'd probably, you might think that. <laughs> Clovis, for example. After the breakup of the Roman Empire, remember, this is going back hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, disorder reigned. Oh, anarchy prevailed. It was a mess of a society. 15-year-old Clovis inherited a small kingdom in the corner of Gaul. That's modern-day France, if you, you know, want to know. King Clovis seized adjoining lands and united Gaul, moved his capital to Paris, and founded the entire nation of France. In 493, Clovis married a Christian girl. She became queen, of course, him being king and everything. Queen, he thought Clovis had a bed, Cloth Hilda. Yeah, really he is. Cloth Hilda. I'm not quite sure what it means, but that's her name. Queen Cloth Hilda. She wanted to baptize their newborn son. Clovis agreed, but when the child died, even in his baptismal gown, Clovis blamed the Christian God. When a second child grew ill following baptism, Clothilda prayed earnestly. The child did recover, and the king was impressed. When Clovis was 30, he was routed in battle. Jesus Christ, he cried from the battlefield even. My wife, Clothilda, says that you are the son of God and can give victory to those who place their hope in you. And you all know right now we could expand that from hope to joy and peace and love and all the things we've been talking about. Give me victory, he said out on the battlefield. Give me victory and I will be baptized myself. Well, the tide of the battle turned and Clovis, true to his word, did enter the Cathedral of Rhymes on December 25th, 496. What we now call, of course, Christmas Day. 496 AD. The priest told him, worship what you once burned and burn what you once worshiped. On that day, 3,000 troops followed Clovis in baptism. The army marched alongside a river where priests chanting the baptismal formula. And I think probably what they're suggesting was the, uh, you know, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, that's probably what they're referring to. Dipped branches from the trees into the stream and flung the water, supposedly making them all Christians. This was a rather momentous day in church history, for it was the first of what's called the great mass conversions that turned Europe into a quote unquote Christian continent. Now you understand what we're saying here. Not really. I mean, where's the faith in Christ? It's just, you know, get baptized and everything's set. Little change was actually detected in Clovis or his troops, who were about as pagan as ever, apparently viewing Christ merely as a war god who ensured them victory. But the stage was set for many genuine believers who spread the message of the babe of Bethlehem throughout an emerging Europe. The stage was set. As we've said, the stage was set, even at Christmas. And guess what? We were there. Oh, you might think, wait a minute, oh, I was born in such and such a year, I was born in... But you, know, you might think, I was there. No. But we were all there. Spiritually speaking, we were all there. Can I show you this? I want to show you this. Right from our hymnal. If you turn, pick up the hymnal again. If you'll turn to number 315, I want to show you something. 
This is a hymn that we sing at our Good Friday service, similar to this service, only it has to do with the crucifixion of Jesus and not the birth of Jesus. Uh, turn to 315. This is, the, this is the hymn, Were You There? This one, for years and years and years, we have sung this hymn at the close of that service. Much in the same way that we sing Silent Night at the close of this service. Were you there? Now, we're not going to sing this. I just want to show you a few of the words. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? See, people sometimes think, you know, no, I was here, you know. I didn't live way back then, and I wouldn't have done that to Jesus and so forth. It's our sin that did this to Jesus. It's our sin for which he went to the cross to take away the power of sin and the power of Satan in our lives. So we were there. As Jesus hung from the cross, he had you on his mind. Amen? Were you there? Get to the last verse. Were you there when he rose up from the dead? Were you there when he rose up from the dead? Sometimes I feel like shouting, glory, glory, glory. Were you there when he rose up from the dead? See, the fact of the matter is, spiritually speaking, we were there. And the same thing is true, I believe, in speaking of these things concerning Christmas. Once again, we're here. Amen? We're here. We were there, even in his mind. Even, he did it for us. He did it for everybody. He did it for the entire world. The Bible says in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen? We were on his mind at that point, and I believe the same thing can be said about Christmas. I think the same thing is true at Christmas, because, quite frankly, he was born to die. That was his purpose in coming. He didn't come to find a girlfriend, to get married, to have children, and all of that other kind of stuff. He came to die, to take away our sin. You see, there's a price for sin. You got to recognize that. And it's called death. That's what the Bible says clearly. There's a price. Well, he came out of his immense love and took and, and paid your price for your sin. And when you receive that, when you let that be a reality. See, we've got to be real. That's what we said at the very outset of this whole thing. We've got to be real. That little girl in that restaurant, for the first time, probably in her entire life, she felt real. Amen. Were you there? Now, I could go ahead and go through the whole Christmas story, but I, I'd rather not. We've done that through the whole Christmas season. We've looked at the stories of uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth and, you know, the future parents of John the Baptist who would come and point the way to Jesus. We talked about all of that. We talked about the angel coming to talk to Mary about this Jesus to be born. We talked about the angel coming and talking to Joseph in a dream about this Jesus to be born. Uh, we talked about all, we even talked about what we're looking at here tonight, the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem and the shepherds that are out in the field. We've already spoken of all of it. But tonight, we want to pull it together. Tonight, that's what I'm saying about these four candles that are wrapped around the Christ candle. It's got to come together. It's got to be real in each and every one of us. Amen? So this Christmas night, I want to focus on the first Christmas night. We could go ahead and look at all the rest of it, talk about it, but, you know, 
actually, if you're interested in, in, in all of that, these messages are online and you can go back and take a look at these things and listen to them and so forth. I want to tell you here, though, what happened on Christmas Day or Christmas night, the, the uh, you know, back 2000, almost 2000 years ago, was not by happenstance. It was all in the hand of God. It was all part of God's plan. So let me show you that. If you've still got your finger pointing to, Mark, to uh, Luke, rather, not Mark, but Luke chapter 2, the first few verses, take a look at this. This is Luke in the New Testament, Chapter 2, it's the Christmas story. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus. Now, he's the king of the world. What he says goes. All right? There went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. I'd like to suggest to you that the Caesar Augustus had no idea what he was doing. I don't really think he knew what he was doing. It was God that told him to issue this decree and thereby require both Mary and Joseph to travel to Bethlehem. Amen? Where Jesus would be born. That all the world should be taxed, verse 2. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee. Will you look at the detail of this? To go up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. Everybody was required to go back to their initial birthplace where their family was from, which in their case was Bethlehem. That's how Jesus would be born in Bethlehem, even though they lived way up in Nazareth. Do you remember the people that came to Jesus and his disciples and said, well, they were kind of arguing with the disciples about it. They said, wait a minute, Jesus can't be any kind of prophet. The Bible doesn't say anything about a prophet coming from Galilee, you know. There's no prophet that was born in Galilee. <laughs> I'm sorry, but these people don't understand what's in the Bible. Okay? They didn't even understand the Jewish scriptures. The fact of the matter is that Jesus was uh, born in Bethlehem. It took this decree from Caesar Augustus to get him there in the first place. And now he's born where he will fulfill the prophecy. Praise God. To be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. Every piece of the puzzle was in place. A few of us went up to see my wife up in the nursing home. Uh, and she's in the uh, Alzheimer's unit. And we were sitting there. And I noticed in the next table, there were two elderly women putting a puzzle together. Uh, it was a big puzzle. I don't mean hundreds and thousands and so forth of pieces. Each piece was like this big. It was called a floor puzzle. You're supposed to do it on the floor. It doesn't turn out to be all that big, but maybe bigger than some tables. But anyway, they were working at it. And before we ended up leaving, they had the whole thing put together. Every piece of the puzzle was in place. Those pieces didn't just fall into place. Those pieces were in this big tube and the, the worker there didn't just take that tube and throw it up in the air and watch the pieces and they all came down and everything fit together. That's not how it happened. It happened because those two women put it together. Amen? They placed those pieces together. They didn't just fall into place. They were placed there. And the same thing is true of these details of how Jesus ends up in Bethlehem with his parents in order to be born in the prophesied place. It was all in God's hand. Amen? It happened 2,000 years ago, and we were there. We were in the mind of God when all this was going on. 
He had a purpose in doing all of it, even fulfilling the prophecy. Praise the name of Jesus. And then it actually happened. Look at verses 6 and 7 of the Christmas story. Luke chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered, referring to Mary having the baby. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. Why? Because there was no room for them in the inn. Was this whole thing, all these pieces of the, was was this coincidence? Was it happenstance that it just happened to happen? Not hardly. It was all in the mind of God. In fact, can I show you that? You don't have to turn there. It's a little book back in the (coughs) Old Testament. It's the prophet Micah. And in chapter 5, verse 2, it says, But thou, Bethlehem, Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel. This is talking about Jesus, people. Talking about Jesus hundreds of years before Jesus was born. And it's going to happen in Bethlehem, the Bible says. It said that long before the, the uh, king of the world issued a decree that everybody has to go to their hometowns long before. Amen? Even says so. From of old, from everlasting. Micah chapter 5, verse 2. We were there. Oh, I don't mean we got on a plane and we traveled to Bethlehem and walked the Holy Land. I don't mean that. I mean, spiritually speaking, we were there. Because we were on the mind of God as he accomplished all these things. We were there once again, right in the middle of God's plan. I want you to notice that the scripture says there was no room for them in the end. Now, for a lot of people, they would blame God for that. (laughs) Okay, God, if you're so smart and you've got everything in control, then why didn't you have room in the end? You know, why not? Why? Why did they go all the way down there and then they have nowhere to stay? Once again, it was part of God's plan. So they would end up in a stable among among, uh, farm animals, I suppose, and laid in a manger. Glory be to God. Many years ago, I ran across a poem slash story about this and um, I want to share it with you some of you I'm sure have not heard it it's called I'm sorry I have no room when Joseph came to the inn that night he was tired weary and worn And Mary, his wife, was weary too, her child about to be born. The innkeeper told them, I have no room, and started to send them away. But wait, he called, I think I can help, though it's only a barn with some hay. They said they'd be grateful for even a barn, at least it was a place to stay. Then Joseph thanked the innkeeper there as he settled his wife in the hay. The stars seemed to shine that first Christmas night as they never shone before. And as Jesus came into the world for us, see, it's for us. They seemed to shine even more. Shepherds strayed to the manger scene, worshiping as they came. Three wise men were led from the Orient far, searching to do the same. It wasn't exactly the place for a king. Why, it wasn't even the inn. No, out in a barn in a manger poor, he was born to take away sin. The innkeeper had no room that night. I wonder, how about you? How about you? How about me? Do we have room for Jesus? If Jesus asked for a place in your heart, what do you think you would do? For you know someday when life is past and you stand at the door of the inn, the Lord may look at you sadly there and you'll hear these words from him. 
I have no room, I'm sorry, my friend. I'm truly sorry to plea. I have no room, he'll tell you once more, for you didn't have room for me. Give credit where credit is due, I suppose. The author of that little poem was Anne Farrell Blunt. At the same time that this was going on in Bethlehem, there was something else just as amazing going on outside of Bethlehem, just outside of town. Look at verses 8 and following. This is uh, Luke chapter 2, beginning with verse 8. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly, suddenly, there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Now, you know the word men is meant to include everybody. So it's men, women, and children. We're all on the same playing field, people. We've got, to start, we've got to stop separating things out and say, this is for the kids and this is for us. You know, the world does that, you know? Kids can go see this movie, but they can't see this movie. Well, then why is it adults are okay about seeing that movie? We were there. That's what God is saying. We were there. Once again, we are here in this place to experience it all over again. Look at verse 15. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing. Look at this, which is come to pass. The shepherds didn't debate the issue. The shepherds didn't wonder what they ought to do. The shepherds didn't argue about it. They didn't say, well, what are we going to do with the sheep? I don't know what they did with the sheep. Maybe they just left them right there. I mean, they did have these pens out in the field, the sheep, the sheep folds. Maybe they just left them all in the sheep. I don't know. But the Bible says they went to go see this thing and that it already came to pass. This isn't just futuristic. This isn't just maybe. All right? It says, which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary, it says here, Mary kept all of these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. Let me close with this thought. Just Think about this. If those shepherds hadn't gone into town and they were never really even told to do so, they were just simply told, this is what you would find if you went into town. <clears throat> if those shepherds had not gone into the town, if the shepherds had not seen what was going on with Mary, Joseph, and the baby. And if those shepherds had not gone out and told everybody else, where would you be tonight? I mean, if everybody just sloughed it off like so many in the world do today, just 
I'm not going to deal with it. Just kind of toss it aside. Don't give it any credence. Where would you be tonight? Fact is, we're here. And we're hearing about God. And we're hearing about Jesus. We're here. Once again, the stage has been set. The whole thing is real. It's very real. Amen? Very real. When you hear all these things, you start to feel that there's somebody that thinks you're real. All it took for, for the little girl was a hot dog and a chocolate shake. Spiritually speaking, God wants us to be real. Every one of our situation has been taken into consideration. God does care who we are and what we think we need on our plates, so to speak. This Christmas, I want you to know in your heart that you were not only there then, but we are all here once again. Tonight. Glory be to God. Once again, we are here. Please join me in prayer as we close. Lord, I want to thank you for the truth that's been given here today. I do believe, dear God, you have an intention in all of that. I thank you, dear God, that you make it clear that you do have a purpose for our lives. We don't have to feel like we're, I don't know, floundering someplace. There is a purpose, and it's Jesus. And I pray, dear God, that each and every one of us, Lord, would see that clearly, know it in the depths of our hearts, and come and let you make us real. Make us really real tonight. Hallelujah. We thank you and we praise you. We love you, and we need you. Glory be to God. Maybe. There's a poem I want to share with you as we close here tonight. Oh, the bitter pain and sorrow that a time could ever be when I proudly said to Jesus, all of self and none of thee. Yet he found me, and I beheld him, bleeding on that accursed tree. And my wistful heart said faintly, some of self and some of thee. Day by day, his tender mercy, healing, helping, full and free, brought me lower while I whispered, less of self and more of thee. Higher than the highest heaven, deeper than the deepest sea. Lord, thy love at last has conquered none of self and all of thee. This Christmas, open your heart first. Amen? Amen. Remember one thought beyond what we've already said here. Yesterday we spoke of it the importance of retaining the essence of Christmas. Not just till tomorrow. Amen? And not just till the first of the year. And not just till next Christmas, but forevermore. Amen? Retain it. Retain it in your heart. Retain it in your spirit. Amen? Don't let this past year be the template for next year. Don't let it be the pattern. There may be some things that the Lord wants you to be, a, a, be about, to repeat, and so forth. But don't just let it be a, a, a pattern or a template. Let God show you every step along the way. You see, because if you, 
if, if you just let one year be a template for the next, you're gonna find yourself being stuck in a rut. Let the flame of his love set you on fire for the Lord this Christmas and throughout the whole year. It is his hope. It is his joy. It is his peace. It is his love. Open your heart to him first. Go in hope. God's hope. Go in joy. Go in peace. And go in love. And have a very merry and blessed Christmas. Amen? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, go with God. Amen.